introduce our first panel. Geopolitical tumult has dominated the headlines in recent years. It has also affected inflation. Central banks must therefore investigate to what degree such uncertainty is likely to affect prices over the coming decades. The next panel will look at the extent to which inflation will remain a big, big influence or be influenced by rather events outside the sphere of economics. It will be chaired by ECB executive board member, Isabel Schnabel. Professor Schnabel, over to you. So thank you, thank you very much, uh, Claire, for your introduction and uh, good morning to everybody. It's a really great pleasure to welcome you to our panel on geopolitical shocks and inflation with four distinguished panelists. So one of the most significant changes over the past years has been the shift in the geopolitical environment. We have witnessed a substantial increase in the frequency and size of geopolitical shocks related to wars, tensions between global powers and the rise of populism. Geopolitical shocks affect our economies in many different ways and they can contribute to the level and volatility of inflation and are therefore an important factor to consider for monetary policy. On the one hand, geopolitical shocks operate through the supply side. Less elastic supply due to acute or more persistent disruptions of supply chains, the risks of a weaponization of commodities such as the critical minerals needed for the green transition, increased protectionism as well as higher energy prices could lead to inflationary pressures. On the other hand, uncertainty due to geopolitical shocks may reduce demand from consumers or investors and lead to precautionary saving behavior, which could have a dampening effect on inflation. A world more prone to geopolitical shocks hence poses challenges for central banks, and I very much hope that our discussion today can shed some light on these challenges. Over and above inflation, the consequences of geopolitical fragmentation could be far-reaching, imposing a high burden on people's welfare globally. It could delay the energy transition and make it much more costly. It could reverse some of the benefits of globalization, which has lifted hundreds of million, uh, millions of people out of poverty. And it could end the peace dividend that we have enjoyed over the past decades. Given the significance of this topic, I'm very happy to welcome my fantastic panel, consisting of four experts who will offer their complementary perspectives on how geopolitical shocks may affect inflation and the economy more generally. So we will have a short introductory remarks of no more than 10 minutes each. And uh, after that, I will first give the chance to the panelists uh, to respond to each other before then opening up the floor for the Q&A. And my first speaker is Matteo Iacoviello, who is a senior associate director at the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. So no one could be better suited to kick off this session than Matteo, who pioneered the economic literature on the topic of our panel with his seminal paper on measuring geopolitical risk, published in 2022 and already quoted more than 2,000 times. This paper provides a measure that is used by numerous economists, including at the ECB, to monitor the frequency and the size of geopolitical shocks and assess their economic effects. So, Matteo, thank you so much for being here. The floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, thanks, Isabel, for your kind words. I will uh, <coughs> be discussing a little bit of uh, the research we've been doing on uh, geopolitical risks and inflation, 
of course, uh, as a disclaimer, the views that I'm going to express here are my own and not the views of uh, the Board of the Governors of the Federal Reserve System or anyone else associated with the Federal Reserve Board. I'm going to give a, a brief definition of what geopolitical risks are, uh, and I'm going to start with the narrow one, the one that you see here. Uh, in a narrow sense, geopolitical risks involve the threat, realization, and escalation of adverse events associated with wars, terrorism, tensions among political actors that can affect the peaceful course of international relations. Now, to be clear, there's also oftentimes uh, in, the, in the academic and journalistic practice a broader definition of what the geopolitical risks can be that sometimes includes uh, climate risks, trade policy tensions, uncertainty over the legal environment uh, that's faced by businesses operating abroad. All these things are important and uh, may be part of what we think of geopolitical risks. I will stick to my narrow definition, but I know that the panelists are gonna cover the rest, so there won't be uh, any, uh, any, not much will be lost. Now, it is instructive to think about geopolitical risks affecting inflation uh, through at least uh, three channels. And I will highlight these channels looking uh, at cross-country historical data and uh, more recent monthly time series data. The first, uh, the three channels I want to highlight, uh, one is, uh, as Isabel already mentioned, is an adverse supply side channel that links geopolitical risks with uh, disruptions to trade, shortages of goods and services, and higher inputs and commodity prices. The second channel is uh, an expansionary demand channel that can uh, somehow compound the first, which is related to the need to finance increase the government expenditures, such as military spending, in the aftermath of geopolitical shocks. Now, when we look at historical data, we find that both channels are important. So typically, and this is kind of a spoiler what we find in our research, geopolitical risks are inflationary. But as already Isabel alluded to earlier, there is at least another channel that is important to keep in mind, which could mitigate the inflationary effects of geopolitical shocks, which has to do with the, any kind of adverse effects that geopolitical uh, uh, events, adverse ones, could uh, have on confidence on financial markets and on aggregate demand more in general. Now, uh, to boot, I want to show you uh, what uh, started our research on the topic, which is the fact that one big hurdle with thinking about geopolitical risks is measuring them. Now, in a series of papers with uh, Dario Caldara and other colleagues at the Fed, we developed the geopolitical risk index that you can see here plotted from 1950 onwards, which is measured by the share of articles in leading international newspapers mentioning adverse geopolitical events and associated risks. Higher values of the index indicate either a greater intensity of current negative events or higher probability of future negative events. Now, you can see from this chart how geopolitical risks have evolved since the end of World War II. Many spikes are, semi are familiar. If they're not, I label them. And, uh, but what I want to draw your attention to is the evolution of geopolitical risks uh, uh, in the last uh, 20 years. Obviously, geopolitical risks soared with 9-11 and with the Iraq War. And then we entered this kind of tranquil period between 2005 and 2021, in which they were kind of around historical average. Starting with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, they've crept up again, and they've been averaging at a much higher value relative to the period uh, uh, pre-Russian invasion. Now, one can think of geopolitical risks at the global level, one can also think about geopolitical risks in the cross-section of countries. So we've uh, kind of extended our methodology to think about geopolitical risks hitting particular countries or regions of the world. And as you can imagine, not all geopolitical risks affect all blocks of the world equally. And uh, there are uh, sometimes regions that are more exposed to some shocks than others. This heat map here compares each country's uh, recent evolution of geopolitical risks with its long run average. And you can see that in the last year, but also if you were to zoom two, three years, you will see the same results. Geopolitical risks have been extremely pronounced in uh, Eastern Europe, in the Middle East, and to some extent also in, uh, in Asia. I, I want to show you some evidence about the relationship between geopolitical risk and inflation, starting with the very simple scatter plots. If you just think about the relationship between geopolitical risk in a particular year, in a particular country, 
and changes in inflation around that time, regardless of the time period you look at, and here I've started really far, far back in time, starting in 1900, the relationship is typically positive. There's only one period in history which is uh, uh, between 1980 and 1999 when the relationship is more or less uh, weaker. But uh, if you look at uh, all periods in history, periods of elevated geopolitical tensions tend to be associated with uh, higher inflation. As usual in macro, whenever we see something like this, we're worried about confounders, and uh, we try and do something more sophisticated. We've done so uh, looking at the panel vector autoregressive model that looks at a variety of countries, uh, 40 countries, 42 countries to be exact, over 125 years. And this is the typical evolution of a country in the aftermath of uh, a geopolitical shock. Geopolitical risk increases, inflation tends to go up, Economic activity tends to go down, so GDP declines, and there's a decline in trade and increase in shortages. So these are kind of the elements summarizing an adverse supply shock, even though at the same time you have an increase in military expenditures, an increase in public spending, an increase in money growth. So as you can see here, following an increase in country-specific geopolitical risk, there's always these supply and demand channels that both actually tend to lead to higher inflation. And one way to think about them is that one can do counterfactuals of the kind that, for instance, Giorgio showed uh, earlier on today, in which one asks the question, okay, what would happen to inflation were supply disruptions not to occur? And you can see that uh, in the top panel, the increase in inflation would be smaller. Similarly, if you were to do a second counterfactual in which you say, okay, what if monetary policy or fiscal policy did not uh, kind of tried to undo some of the negative effects on activity of higher geopolitical risk. Again, you will have a smaller increase in inflation, but at the cost of a larger GDP decline. So this kind of evidence suggests that geopolitical risks do create, do create trade-offs for policymakers, because typically they have the workings of an adverse supply shock, and you can accept higher inflation, lower inflation only at the cost of a, a lower, a higher decline in GDP. Uh, so that's the nature of the trade-off. We've done uh, one, uh, no, one issue with uh, working with long-run data is that one is always uh, skeptical of uh, evidence that comes from uh, very, very far back in time, long before our young economists were, were born or even their parents were born. So uh, what happens if you actually uh, zoom in on uh, more recent events taking a look at uh, a larger range of global macro and financial variables. So we've done so uh, looking uh, in particular at a scenario that considers at a, looking at a macroeconomic model that uh, starts only in 1970 and uh, consider a lar considers a larger range of macroeconomic variables such as oil prices, confidence, and so on. When we simulate what happened to the global economy in the aftermath of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, sizing the shock to be as large as the realization of geopolitical risk that we saw in the data, we calculate that that shock reduced global GDP by 1% and increased the global inflation by uh, slightly more than one percentage point. Now, you should keep in mind that obviously uh, there's a large dispersion of these effects, because as I showed you earlier, sometimes you have a global shock, but some countries, some regions, may be hit much harder than others. So if one were to plug, plug this result into our panel VR that I showed you earlier, one could get also different responses to inflation in different uh, places. And uh, this is a summary of how the recent shock has transmitted. Uh, going back to the issue of affecting confidence, you can see that when you look at more recent data, typical geopolitical shocks are associated with uh, a decline in consumer confidence, an increase in the dollar, so probably kind of a sign that there is more anxiety in financial markets, an increase in oil and commodity prices, and also a decline in stock prices. So the decline in confidence and tighter financial conditions point to an additional channel that could mitigate adverse inflationary effects and suggest that in general, looking at the effects of geopolitical risks always requires thinking exactly how they are transmitted through trade, through confidence, and through the policy response. And uh, the bottom line is what I already said uh, and should be clear, 
And as I said, the magnitude of effects may reflect a variety of forces and may change depending on them. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much, Matteo, for kicking off this session. And this brings me to our uh, second speaker, uh, who I think has a lot of trust in historical data. So I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm de delighted to welcome Moritz Schullerich, who is uh, the president of the Kiel Institute for the World Economy, uh, a professor of economics at Sciences Po and a dear former colleague. So Moritz is an empirical macroeconomist and um, economic historian who has changed profoundly our knowledge about long-run uh, developments by collecting and analyzing long-run economic data from historical sources. And many of us have benefited from the macro history database, which he and his co-authors have made avail available to the research uh, community. So Moritz will talk about the price of war, presenting historical evidence on how war uh, impact economic activity and inflation not only in the directly affected country, but also in other countries, depending on their geographical distance from the conflict. So we're delighted to have you here. The floor is yours. Good morning, and uh, thank you, Isabel. Thank you for inviting me. I want to start, if the slides play along, with a map of Europe. Uh, a map of Europe in the aftermath of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, showing the geographical dispersion of inflation in the EU in the year after. And as you can see, there's a clear visual gradient going from east to west. And what this illustrates is that we as economists and, and you as central bankers have to turn our attention to a rather unpleasant topic, namely the macroeconomic impact of wars. We live, and that's the topic of this session, in an era of geopolitics, and uh, wars are the ultimate realization of geopolitical risk, to pick up on, on what Matteo just said. Uh, they bring, wars bring death and destruction, and uh, many economic disasters are associated with wars on, on a country's own soil, you, uh, as in, in the work of, of Barra and others. But wars, are also, wars also bring expansionary shocks to, to military spending and, and pull economies out of recessions. So what I want to focus on today, as Isabel said, was what about the other countries? Do they pay a price for the war too? And the answer I'm going to give you is a very strong yes. The adverse economic impact of war spills over from the war side, and the exposure of other countries depends crucially on their distance from the war side. So there's going to be a gravity element in here. Nearby countries pay, substan pay a substantial price of war, even if they're not party to the war. So you might say this is not something we have to worry about that often. I think we have to. While it's very rare to be have a, luckily, uh, unfortunately, to have a war on country's own soil, only about 1% unconditionally, it's actually not as rare to be adjacent, to be a neighbor to a war uh, in, in the long-run historical data. So this chart shows you the unconditional probability of being adjacent, an adjacent country to a war in our samples, roughly 8.5%. That's roughly twice as high as the unconditional probability of having a financial crisis. So this is something we uh, uh, should and need to understand. How do we go about determining the macroeconomic impact of war? So first, we, as Isabel mentioned, we collect a lot of data, uh, long-run historical macro data from the Correlates of War project, and we, uh, we join them with our very own macro history database. Uh, Alan is here, so this is a, a co-authored work. And what we find in this work is that the average effect of large wars, and we define large wars as la wars with casualties of more than 10,000 um, uh, people, is a quite, a quite substantial. In the war side, GDP falls on average by 30% and inflation rises by 15 percentage points. In nearby countries, and think about this as the neighbor, the neighboring country, GDP still falls about by about one third of that, by 10% and inflation rises by about five percentage points. Then interesting, if you turn to distant foreign countries, this is sort of the country, if you will, on the other side of the of the earth, the, the country that's furthest away from the war site, the GDP effects can even be positive and inflation is basically flat. 
Uh, let me give you a quick idea how we get to these results. And this is just the bare bones local projection here where we relate the out dynamic uh, outcome in the war side and on foreign, uh, foreign economies to the uh, outbreak of a war. And in the paper, obviously, we talk a lot about the exogeneity of these wars and they're driven by politics and uh, very rarely by business cycle considerations. Uh, and then we measure the impact of the war on the out on output growth and on inflation, both in the home country, which here is the war side, and uh, on the foreign country. And then there's a bunch of controls, and the details are in the joint paper with uh, Jonathan Gernot and others. Um, this is the baseline results. If you look at the, the effects in the war side, they're strong and diverse, and, but then we find no spillovers on, on other countries on average. So you see here on the left-hand side, left panel, the output response in home, which is the war side. GDP falls by about 30% uh, over time. On the right-hand side, inflation about 15 percentage points higher. As I mentioned earlier, you see also the gray line for the foreign countries on average. Very little effect. A little bit inflationary. I think that meshes well with what Matteo just presented us. But if we zoom in and we condition the spillovers on geographic distance from the war side, a very different picture emerges. Now you see that the nearby country, which is the neighboring country, is very strongly affected by the war. The GDP falls uh, cumulatively by uh, 10%, uh, and uh, where it rises actually in distant. Uh, and the picture for inflation is also very similar. It, it, wars are inflationary uh, for the nearby economy and uh, barely uh, move inflation for distant countries. If we summarize this in, 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 one, uh, in one table, um, you, you get sort of the key results here, where in the home country, output falls by roughly 30% in a major war. Inflation by, uh, rises by 16 percentage points. And then importantly, the nearby country, which is the neighboring country, uh, has, still has similar effects, but only about a third of the, si the size. Now, this is a very, this is a very simple, and in, in the paper, there's more bells and whistles to everything, but this is, this is the average effect of a major war. And the major war, the war side that's affected by a major war in our sample, uh, represents about 6% of global GDP. If you want to scale this in your head to the Russia-Ukraine uh, situation, they, together they account for not quite 2% of global GDP, so you want to divide these effects roughly by three to um, understand the spillovers to nearby countries like Poland or the Baltic countries, uh, and uh, potentially the positive effects on, on, distant, uh, on distant economies. So what's missing is, I haven't told you about why this is happening. What's the transmission channel? How do we think about this in a structural way? So what we do is we turn to a multi-country model of the world economy, very much in the spirit of Kita's work and, and Eichenbaum's work, where the home country, which is the war side, is closely integrated with a nearby country, with a neighbor, but much less with distant. Then what happens is the war and the war side destroys the capital stock and lowers productivity as we, these soldiers have to go and fight and they can't do productive jobs anymore. And also military spending increases globally, but not the same in every, in every economy. If we calibrate the model with, with, the, um, with the data that, uh, they calibrate the model, it accounts pretty well for uh, the patterns we, we saw in the data and I showed you earlier. There's an adverse supply shock in the war side that spills over to neighbors through a trade channel. In the nearby country, in the neighboring country, uh, there is an endogenous investment contraction as intermediate inputs, uh, imports uh, decline. And for the distant economy, there's a positive effect coming from some trade rerouting and the increase in military spending, which we also see in the, in the, in the distant economy, although slightly less. So if we uh, inspect the mechanism in the, in the mirror of the model, you see very nicely these supply-side spillovers to nearby. So wars are really these sort of adverse supply shocks to neighboring economy. You see the negative import volume response in the middle panel. That's very strongly for the, the red line here being the, uh, the, the nearby economy and the blue line being the distant economy. So decreased import of intermediates leading to fall in investment and output in the, in the nearby economy. Uh, that is uh, uh, quite pronounced in, in, the day, in, in the model here. So where does this lead us? It leads us to a conclusion where uh, we, we call this sort of the gravity of war, uh, where there are large adverse effects in the war side that are transmitted to the international economy through a trade channel. And these spillovers are large and long-lasting for near, near, nearby countries. Uh, 
They are, tend to be smaller or can be even positive for distant countries. The mechanism is, in our, in our view, is one where the negative supply shocks dominate in the vicinity of the war site, but then decline with distance and are then partly even offset by trade rerouting and increased military spending. This, for monetary policy, of course, this raises some rather unpleasant trade-offs, as being close to a war site gives rise to a trade-off. The fallout of that adverse supply shock, that negative supply shock, cannot be fully contained or stabilized away. Moreover, if our historical data and, and the patterns we find are correct, then uh, these effects are, while not permanent, and there is an interest and an important literature showing that countries eventually bounce back from wars and from the destruction and, and, and can grow a, a relatively fast even in the aftermath of, of wars. So while not permanent, these effects last multiple years. So they, are not, they make it rather difficult uh, for central banks to just look through the shock as uh, the response lasts well longer than the uh, typical transmission mechanism of monetary policy. Um, so overall, I think this is a, a picture of the macroeconomics of, of war that points to an important external cost of conflict, uh, borne mostly by the neighboring countries and uh, transmitted to the global economy through uh, uh, trade channels. Thank you very much. So thank you, thank you, Moritz. It's always fascinating uh, work. And we now uh, move on to uh, our third panelist, Beata Javocic, who is chief economist at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and a professor of economics currently on leave from Oxford uh, University. The recent uh, transition report, which is a flagship report of the EBRD under Beata's responsibility, has a superb chapter about the role of global supply chains for the green transition. And based on this, Beata will discuss the important question of how geopolitical tensions may affect the supply of critical raw materials and what this will uh, imply for the climate transition. So thank you very much, Beata, for being here, and we are looking forward to your remarks. Well, good morning. Thank you, Isabel, and thank you very much for having me here. Um, so I'm going to make a few observations about um, critical raw materials. Now, as you all know, green transition is going to increase the demand for many minerals. Um, and that's because, because, for instance, production of an electric car requires six times as much in terms of mineral input than production of a combustion engine car. And you see that gray part of the bar, that is graphite that's needed. Now, similarly, if you look about at what is needed to produce um, offshore wind uh, production facilities, um, again, they are much more intensive in mineral inputs than, for instance, coal-based power plants. And if you are eagled eye, you see at the end of the chart a little purple part that's rare earth input. Rare earth, these are these powerful magnets that you put in wind turbines. Now, who is producing um, these uh, critical raw materials? Well, it turns out that a lot of production is concentrated in China, and rare earth and graphite, uh, what they have in common is that almost two-thirds of their production takes place in China. Um, graphite was in the news last year because China introduced export restrictions. Now, the other two uh, minerals that were in the news last year were germanium and gallium. China is responsible for more than 90% of their production. And last year, China introduced export restrictions on th these minerals in retaliation for the US CHIPS Act that restricted flows of technology to China. So production is concentrated. Now, what about reserves? Um, so for the transition report, we 
looked at the data at the level of individual mines. We looked at known reserves associated with the mines. And I'm stressing here known because reserves are dynamic. They are a function of exploration. And then we looked at where these mines are located and who owns them, taking the, the larger uh, shareholder um, as, as the nationality of the owner. And we split um, this ownership of known reserves into two, the Western Bloc and other countries. We defined the Western Bloc and its allies as countries that voted in a similar manner at the UN National Assembly between 2014 and 2021, using sort of standard policy uh, measures. And what you see here is the blue part of the chart uh, shows the reserves, the share of reserves um, that are in the hands of the Western Bloc, the orange part uh, in the hands of, of others. Um, the bars don't always add up to 200% because some information is, is missing. But what emerges from the picture is that there are actually quite a few critical raw materials where the West owns only a small share of reserves. Think about graphite. The Western Bloc owns about, only about a third. Now, if you think about rare earth, uh, it's only about a tenth of known um, reserves. Uh, now, what we have also seen in the last few years is proliferation of export restrictions. Now, some of these export restrictions are introduced in order to uh, develop national industry. Think about um, sort of nickel restrictions on exports of nickel in Indonesia. That's the desire of the country to move up the sort of higher uh, value added, not to export resources, but to export products. Some of those restrictions are part of efforts uh, to weaponize trade. So we looked at um, 2017 exports, and then we applied to them 2017 restrictions, and then restrictions from uh, last year, 2023. Um, and the dots represent the 2017 restrictions, and the bars show um, the latest available restriction. So you see, uh, first of all, that if you look at the average, we've seen an increase in exports uh, of critical raw minerals, materials that are subject to some form of restrictions. Um, and uh, in many of the individual minerals, um, this increase has been quite substantial. Um, think about rare earth elements. It increased from, a, from more than a fifth to uh, about 45%. We saw uh, also an increase uh, in um, restrictions on exports of graphite. Now, why does it matter? Well, it matters because these are things that are needed for green transition. And we would argue, we argue in the report that um, greater proliferation of export, of geopolitical tensions may not be compatible with green transition simply because it creates the risk of Europe or other Western countries uh, being cut off from what is needed uh, for the success of green transition. And actually, if you look at a broader category of uh, critical products, so these are critical raw materials plus things such as semiconductors, uh, PPP equipment, um, you see that there has been uh, quite an increase in the share of exports subject to restrictions. Um, and this increase has been faster in critical products than in, in other products. About a third, uh, if you take 2017 flows, about a third of, of those flows would be now under uh, some form of export restrictions. And escalation of trade tensions. We just last few weeks heard about uh, the US um, introducing 100% tariff on electric vehicles, uh, Europe considering similar tariffs. Uh, this introduction of new tariffs is likely to be met uh, with response uh, from other countries, including China. And uh, restrictions on exports may be one type of response. So, what does it imply for you central bankers? Right? The first thing, what is certain is that 
Export restrictions can be introduced at the stroke of a pen. It's something that's fairly uh, easy to introduce. And opening a mine takes a long time. On average, making a mine operational takes about 16 years, one six. And you know, when I come back to, uh, to rare earth, um, there are actually um, large deposits in Sweden near Kiruna, and the state-owned company that is developing uh, those deposits said they would need between 10 and 15 years um, to, to make them uh, operational. Um, so, while the European efforts uh, to secure access to critical raw materials are absolutely needed um, and they are um, commendable, actually they, it is hard to secure alternative sources of supply fast. And also, you know, it, perhaps it's not a coincidence that uh, a lot of um, not just mining but also processing of those critical raw materials takes place in other countries. Again, if you think about the rare earth, they are often found together with radioactive uh, substances. So processing them is actually very polluting. And actually, so far, you know, in Europe, our appetite for, uh, for having these very polluting activities um, has been limited. Okay, so this was what, what was certain. What about the known unknowns? So three questions, right? Will geopolitical tensions uh, lead to further export restrictions? How will uh, discussions with China play out? That's, I think, the first known unknown. The second one is what will happen um, to the speed of green transition? We have seen some reconfiguration uh, in Brussels after the latest European elections, and that may affect the demand for critical raw materials. And of course, the interaction of supply and demand will uh, have an impact on prices and hence inflation. And then the third uh, known unknown is innovation, a high a price spike in critical raw materials, in a particular uh, raw material, creates big incentive for innovation, for finding ways of substituting away from it. Um, so how fast will innovation allow us uh, to substitute from uh, those critical raw materials um, that we need? So the bottom line is that critical raw materials and the policies affecting them is something central banks need to uh, keep an eye on because they may be a source of inflationary shocks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Beata. This is a very important uh, work. And we, we are now moving to our final speaker, who is Jan Hatzios, chief economist at Goldman Sachs. And he has been called the most accurate economist, not, not least for being one of the few predicting the recession in the wake of the global financial crisis. Jan is a, a frequent contributor to public debates on key economic issues, including monetary policy. And uh, he will um, add a market's perspective to today's discussion. And more precisely, he's going to speak about uh, the uh, impact of rising protectionism on the global economy and monetary policy. So we are very much looking forward to your remarks. All right. Thank you so much for having me. I am going to talk about the economic impact of potential escalation of trade tensions, uh, especially in the next administration in the United States. Um, on, and I, I'm going to look at impact on inflation, impact on growth, and potential impact on monetary policy, both in the euro area and in the United States. And the upshot of my talk is that a renewed trade war implies potentially more monetary policy divergence because it's likely to raise inflation more in the United States but hit growth more in the euro area. And if we could move to the first chart, just looking at some of the proposals that have been floated by former President Trump's advisors, a 10% across the board tariff on all US trading partners, 
as well as a 60% tariff on China. If you got both of those proposals, that would raise the effective tariff rate on all U.S. imports, average tariff rate by about 16 percentage points by our calculations, uh, which would make the effective tariff rate the highest in the post-war period. Now, there's a ton of uncertainty, of course, about what will happen. We don't know the outcome of the election. We don't know what policies a new administration would actually propose. And we don't know what would happen in global negotiations, what kinds of trade restrictions would actually uh, take place. But we want to look at a potential scenario in which, um, not a worst case scenario, but a pretty significant scenario, in which the United States imposes an across the board tariff of 10% on all imports. Other countries retaliate, raise their uh, tariff rates on US imports by, by 10 percentage points. We also assume that each government recycles the additional tariff revenue into tax cuts. So from that perspective, it's fiscally neutral. Uh, and then lastly, we assume that trade policy uncertainty rises to the levels observed at the peak of the 2018-2019 trade war. That may be a conservative assumption because we're talking about significantly larger increases in tariffs. That said, we have gone through a trade war episode, so perhaps from an uncertainty perspective, that would provide some offset. But I do view the assumption as conservative. Now, this would have important effects on both inflation and growth. Let me start with the inflation effects. Um, there, the effects in the US are likely to be much larger. There are four effects to keep track of. Number one, a direct effect of tariffs on consumer prices. Number two, an indirect effect on consumer prices via higher intermediate goods prices, tariffs on intermediate goods. Number three, uh, an impact from FX moves, potential dollar appreciation, and then some small disinflationary effects from uh, weaker, uh, weaker resource utilization and uh, Phillips curve effects. When we add all of these up, we get, again, a small impact in the, in the euro area of one-tenth of a percentage point. We get 1.1 uh, percentage point in the, in the United States. Let's turn to the growth effects. Again, there are four effects to keep track of. One, a hit to real income, um, which is simply the impact on prices on real disposable household income. Then an offset from the assumption that we assume, uh, from, from the assumption that the tariff revenue is recycled. That is not a full offset because we assume that tariffs hit basically lower and middle income consumers by more, whereas tax cuts uh, will benefit a higher income population. Number three, a hit from trade policy uncertainty, which I'm going to discuss in a minute because that is really central. And then number four, some changes in net trade from both the effect of tariffs on domestically produced versus foreign produced goods and also changes in the exchange rate. And the upshot here is that we get a 1% hit to Euro area GDP and a 0.5% hit to US GDP. Now, the key is trade policy uncertainty. There are, of course, different measures of trade policy uncertainty. Uh, there is a measure produced by the Federal Reserve. Um, uh, Matteo, um, uh, obviously, very involved in that. Uh, there are other measures that we have developed that look at not news searches, but uh, mentions of trade policy uncertainty in corporate earnings calls. There was a big spike in trade policy uncertainty in 2018, 2019, and it has recently started to rise again 
and would undoubtedly rise, uh, rise much further under the assumptions that I have laid out. Now, how do we estimate the impact of trade policy uncertainty on growth? We basically have three different approaches. Uh, number one, an, a measure or an analysis at the firm level where we relate mentions of trade policy uncertainty in corporate earnings calls to investment at the firm level. Number two, we look at stock returns around trade news at the firm level and relate that to investment of those firms that have proven to be more susceptible to trade policy uncertainty. And then number three, we do a cross-country analysis uh, involving 34 countries since 1962 that takes trade policy uncertainty shocks and looks at those relative to investment. And the results obviously differ across the approaches, but we consistently find that the euro area is more susceptible uh, than, the, than the United States with averages of 0.9% from this channel in, in Europe and 0.3% in the US. Lastly, we explore the potential monetary policy implications of, of these findings and we take a very simple Taylor rule with 1.5 for inflation and 0.5 for GDP. We find a small dovish effect on euro area monetary policy amounting to about 30, minus 30 basis points and a more hawkish effect, uh, more significant hawkish effect for the US amounting to about 110 basis points. Now there are two very important caveats, uh, especially for the US. Number one, this is basically a price level effect. Um, it is more like a VAT hike, barring continued escalation or other types of amplification. It should drop out after uh, a year. And number two, the baseline outlook, the market's baseline outlook, the Fed's baseline outlook, our uh, baseline outlook is that the Fed's going to be cutting over the next couple of years. We have 200 basis points of Fed cuts in our baseline. So that means these results are not a reason for the Fed to hike interest rates in response to a trade policy shock or even to forego cuts for a, very, for a multi year period. But I do think they are a potential reason to delay cuts in an environment in which other central banks, including uh, the ECB, uh, are likely to be, to be cutting rates and perhaps that is reinforced by some of these findings. Um, so lastly, I would just say there are obviously a lot of risks around this. I've laid out one scenario. There are many assumptions here. There are many potential variations of these scenarios. It could, of course, easily be that, for example, negotiations result in much smaller tariff changes. Um, but there is also a downside scenario, which would be a broadening of these tariffs. Uh, I looked at the across-the-board tariff. I did not look, for example, at China tariffs. Uh, if we did see substantial China tariffs on top of something like this, uh, this would, of course, reinforce the conclusions both on the inflation side and on the growth side, and probably to some degree also on the monetary policy side. Thank you. So th thank you very much, uh, Jan. This was uh, uh, very, very interesting. Um, so what, what I've learned from these presentations, especially from the two charts that we had in the first two presentations, is that you know, we had kind of golden, golden years before the Russian invasion of, uh, of Ukraine started, but we, we were not really aware of that. So now we know these were golden years. Since then, um, geopolitical uh, risk has surged. I mean, that, of course, leads to um, um, human suffering. But beyond that, it also has economic uh, effects, um, high inflation, uh, lower growth. Uh, we've seen that uh, distance matters, and I think some, uh, some of my colleagues know very well what Moritz is talking about. There are also uh, longer-run uh, effects of, of geopolitical uh, fragmentation. 
uh, it may have an effect on climate transition, on uh, potential growth. There is this, uh, this risk of uh, what some people call greenflation. And uh, so this is an issue that we need to deal with also as uh, central banks. So um, I would just like to raise two questions and then uh, all of you can maybe uh, uh, comment briefly, but uh, please feel free to also respond to anything that you found interesting in the other uh, presentation. So my first question would be, uh, so in my introduction, I talked about, uh, about the supply side and the demand side uh, effects. Uh, I mean, going in, in uh, different directions on inflation, but it seemed that all of you came to the conclusion that overall the, uh, the um, inflationary effect is likely to dominate. Maybe you can briefly, briefly comment uh, on that. And the second question then, and that uh, differs a bit on uh, depending on what you precisely talked about. So what is the implication for policymakers, I mean, for monetary policy in particular, but also, if you like, more uh, generally. And uh, yeah, maybe we'd start again with um, Matteo, if you like. Uh, so as I mentioned already during my presentation, it all boils down to what, uh, which channels dominate more in the aftermath of a geopolitical shock. We learned uh, time and again uh, over history that uh, while there is a common uh, kind of way of defining what geopolitical risks are, uh, the ramifications they take are different throughout history. And uh, trying to, our approach is trying to obviously learn some uh, general lessons about what geopolitical risks do, but uh, it is important to keep in mind that not all geopolitical shocks are created equal. Even, uh, <clears throat> Looking at the Cuban Missile Crisis was probably the closest that sometimes people claim uh, mankind came to uh, uh, big problems uh, in uh, the last 60 years. But then that evaporated pretty quickly and we didn't see large effects uh, of the kind that we are talking about these days. 9-11 uh, was a different uh, kind of shock again where confidence probably was affected much more than in other situations. Uh, oftentimes we repeat the uh, the event, the, 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 what happened uh, in the, around the, the Gulf War in 1990. The first shock, which was the invasion of Kuwait, led to a large increase in oil prices and inflationary pressures and uh, adverse effects on economic activity. And then uh, six months later, in February 1991, the actual war began. And one thing that financial markets actually started thinking was, the pro was, was that probably all that sequel the beginning of the war and the unfolding of the war was actually a resolution of the uncertainty that had begun six months earlier, which actually all the sequel was probably not too bad for economic activity. Uh, I'm not talking about obviously human consequences of that. So for policymakers, it's important to draw what the, the general lessons are, which is that uh, on average throughout history, geopolitical shocks are inflationary. We learned uh, from my work, from uh, Moritz's work that uh, distance matters, uh, what kind of markets are affected matters, uh, financial markets is one, commodity markets is another one, obviously what happens to trade and uh, sourcing of key inputs is important and uh, policymakers should be obviously aware of that, look at uh, uh, what's happening on the ground, communicate what plans they have in mind uh, depending on how uncertainty unfolds and, uh, and uh, tailor their policy response accordingly. Thank you, Matteo. Moritz? Well, I think it's important to note that we only look at realized mm -hmm. geopolitical risks. We look at, at, at the wars, and there we don't see uh, this sort of this dampening confidence effect that Matteo talked about. We don't, simply don't see that in the data. Um, my suggestion would be that probably whatever there is in terms of, you know, maybe uh, saving change, shifts in savings behavior, et cetera, is just simply dominated by the fiscal response that we see to these realized shocks. So I think one of the, maybe even in Germany at some point, we'll see a fiscal response now to the war in Europe, but typically that's what we see and can measure very nice. And also the fiscal response sort of is, has this distant gradient in, in neighboring countries. And I think we see that in Poland now and in other countries do increase fiscal expenditures quite a lot. And I think that just simply overwhelms these confidence effects. So in our work, um, as to your question very clearly, um, negative supply shocks, uh, uh, um, growth uh, negatively affected and, and inflation higher. Yeah. 
Yeah. So three points from my side. Um, we haven't talked much about reshaping of global value chains. So if you look at very detailed data uh, at the level of US importer and products, so 10-digit harmonized system products, you see that importers who were hit by the tariffs introduced by the Trump administration, they decreased the share of imports coming from China, they increased the share coming from other places, Vietnam, other Asian countries, or Mexico, and the unit values went up. So that clearly will have some inflationary uh, implications. Second, let me uh, come back to Moritz's presentation. He started out showing the map of Europe and the inflation in, right uh, in the aftermath of, of Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine. And you saw Baltic states were particularly affected because in Baltic states, households saw the high prices of, of natural gas being passed immediately into bills. Now, when we did um, a household survey asking people um, about climate change in terms of economic trade-off, um, should governments prioritize environment over jobs? Are you willing to pay more taxes um, to help fight climate change? Um, the enthusiasm was particularly low in Baltic countries as well as in Central Europe and in Germany. And I think that was perhaps due to the fact that suddenly people felt what it's like to, to have these very high energy prices and they perhaps made a connection um, to sort of energy uh, transition. Finally, uh, let me mention a much less uh, often mentioned implication of um, sanctions on Russia and um, uh, the war. Sanctions uh, led to freezing of Russian reserves. They cut off many Russian banks uh, from the SWIFT system. Um, and that sent chills down the spines of countries not aligned with the West that revived discussion about uh, BRICS launching their own currency. What you see in the data on Russian imports is increased prominence of renminbi as a currency of invoicing. So while in 2016 only 10% of exports from China to Russia uh, was denominated in renminbi, by now it's about 80%. Uh, you also see that third countries are using renminbi as currency of invoicing. Within vehicles currency, the share is now about 12% in trade with Russia. Um, and in particular, this is done um, by countries that are not participating in sanctions and that have swap lines with the People's Bank uh, of China. Um, you also see that when um, products subject to Western sanctions are being traded, they are less likely to be traded, invoiced in US dollars, more likely to be invoiced in renminbi, perhaps because uh, US dollars transactions leave a trace. And you also see that on the import side, larger transactions are more likely to be in Western currencies, while smaller Russian importers are more likely uh, to use invoices in renminbi, and that's probably linked to the cost of processing um, payments in Russia, which has uh, obviously went up after um, the sanctions affected SWIFT system. Very important point. So, Jan. I have two quick points. One is that I think the impact or the implications for monetary policy of these types of shocks, I think it's difficult to generalize. It depends a lot on the specifics of the shock and the, the empirics. In the uh, scenario that I looked at, a lot revolves around, for example, the effect of trade policy uncertainty on, on growth. If that is uh, very prominent, then you'll end up with dovish implications for monetary policy and potentially vice versa. And I think that's probably a you know, stand-in or metaphor for other questions in that area as well, where it's, it's quite hard to say confidently without having done the empirical work what policy should do. The other observation is, you know, I really liked Matteo's chart and the average level of geopolitical risk having been significantly higher, that really resonates. I mean, I've been 
in the economic forecasting business for a little over a quarter century since the late 1990s. And if I think about the, just the importance of geopolitical shocks, trade policy shocks, exogenous shocks, COVID obviously being the most extreme one of those, uh, versus imbalances in the economy and imbalances in the financial system that really sort of dominated the way that we, we thought about things for you know, many years, especially pre-08, but, but, but you know, post in the, in the years after as well. And more recently, these exogenous shocks have just become a lot more prominent and we're probably in that environment for good. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. So I, I think as a general uh, takeaway, it's clear we need to look at uh, each situation specifically. And, and I mean, just yesterday we heard the president's speech about an unusual cycle. And so this is, of course, precisely what we are doing. We are, we are looking at uh, each individual cycle and try uh, to, to understand what is going on. So let me open the floor uh, for questions. I'm sure there are, there are many. All right, Ricardo. Question mostly to Moritz. One of the first impacts of war is an enormous explosion in public debt, not just because of the military spending, but because of the fall in tax revenues and all other spending associated with it. Can you therefore elaborate in your results to what extent, not just distance, but the level of debt before the conflict starts affects these responses? After all, monetary history or the history of central banks shows us that during very large conflicts, a central bank is in many ways very much a manager of the public debt and trades off an expected inflation to inflate some of it away with keeping inflation the control in order to be able to keep the debt market going. So can you tell me a little bit about public debt in the context of wars? And also looking in the recent past, the extent to which the very large stocks of debt in many countries has constrained the way in which we've been able to respond to the Russian invasion of Ukraine and can lead further constraints looking forward. Moritz, let me connect yeah. three questions if that's okay. So Francois, please. No, a fascinating and frightening panel. One obvious question to Professor Schulerich, very simple and obvious. Uh, if I refer to the past, we should have a significant fall in GDP in Russia as war site. Why don't we have it? Thank you. So I think I had Chris. Yeah, my question was mainly for Jan. So if we look at the tariffs, if we think these are just a one-time level effect, it seems like the ultimate supply shock that a central bank should just look through. Because it's going to hit, it's going to raise, leave it alone. There's no sense of raising rates, bringing rates down on a Taylor rule for something you know is just this one-time level effect. So just your thoughts on that. Let me take one more question for her, please. Then I move to the other side. Um, sorry. I have a question for Beata. I mean, you pointed out uh, very clearly this um, uh, shortage of uh, graphite and other rare and rare earths, et cetera, in Europe and or in many places, and that it's being produced in China and like imposing export restrictions. Uh, but I'm thinking, I mean, cl climate change is a global problem. So um, if China chooses to limit exports of rare earths so they can put up more wind power faster, you know, the climate doesn't care where the wind power uh, is established. Maybe it's even better to put it in China. Um, or a faster rollout of battery-driven cars. Um, secondly, if they do that, they kind of make it extra cheap. So it's just a subsidy for their industry um, to, and it's a bit inefficient because then they don't invest enough in innovation to kind of save, to use these uh, efficiently, these inputs. Uh, but broadly, um, you know, maybe it seems more an argument about industrial policy than um, anything uh, in terms of climate change. Because whether we uh, produce those or they use it doesn't make a difference on the emissions. All right. So let me get back to you. So, yeah, happily start, um, Ricardo. Thanks for that. It's an excellent question. So I just. To start with, to confirm, is indeed what we see in the data is that, of course, central banks in wars, uh, major balance sheet expansions happen, and they become, in a, in a way, the sort of the manager of, of of public finances in these in this situation. And it's sort of the the only other big uh, historical regularity of financial crisis. These are the two instances when central bank balance sheet really 
like expand quite quite significantly time and again in history. Um, the uh, inflation response and the in the war side, and I think I can combine this with the question. In our coding, Russia is not a war site because there haven't been more than 10,000 casualties on Russian soil. We, you know, it's just all the fighting is in Ukraine, and I think, I mean, I think the military always knows that. I think one of the main, if you will, policy lessons from ours is like never have a war on your own soil because this is really where the major damage occurs and and where the where the where the uh, uh, where the um, um, the, de 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 deconstruct the 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 destruction really uh, kicks in. Uh, we haven't particularly looked at uh, is the inflation response conditional on the ex ante preceding level of public debt, but it's something we can we can easily do in terms of the inflation spillovers. We haven't also looked we have not looked at it, but I would expect since that operates through trade and sort of inefficiency in in in, in the trading system, I would surprise if there is a connection to public debt. But it's it's um, it's something we should look at. Um, the fiscal response and, and the military spending response, I mean, this is one of the big debates in Germany right now, to what extent this constitutes an emergency situation. I can say historically, um, uh, it was well understood in the, the gold standard rules, et cetera, that these were emergency situations when you suspended the rules and the conservative sort of Anglo-Saxon tradition, if you will, that you use the space, the fiscal space you build up in normal times to use in these emergency situations. And, uh, you know, for the shorter, this is how England beat Napoleon at the bond market and could uh, finance a lot of these uh, expenditures short run. Um, is there going to be any, I mean, uh, more qualified people in the room to talk about the German budget situation? But I think um, there is a, there's definitely something happening in the country that people understand that's just... Sustainability also implies sustainability of peace and prosperity, and not just public finances. Yeah. So you had another question, right? Or did I have Russia GDP? Francois? Oh, the, the, that's that's the reason. So. Uh, um, it's true. So I think um, the fiscal response in Russia has been extremely robust. And I mean, I think this is also, this is also a lesson we have like from, from previous build-ups and war economies that up to a certain point, really, you can, by going full into the, the military build-up, you can sustain production. Uh, I don't know, I don't think, like, if you look at consumption and other indicators of well-being, they're, they're way down, and that's also true for Russia. Um, one very important insight, I think, that's connected work, and, and, and Yuri Gordon-Yuchenko had a very nice CPR report on this recently, um, is that, of course, the revenues from the commodity exports sustain uh, and can sustain and can help sustain this sort of uh, war machine and hence also the, 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 the production going forward. But in principle, you're right. The, big, the, big, the reason why we don't have um, these um, larger GDP effects in Russia right now in our logic and the logic of that paper is that Russia is not yet uh, or not, not a war site in that, in that sense. So there's very little destruction on Russian soil. Um, if I may add to the question about Russia, um, the West imposed export sanctions on Russia that led to a very dramatic drop in exports from Europe to Russia. There has been some intermediated trade, but it accounts only for a relatively small share of, of trade that uh, is not coming from Europe directly. So, you know, import substitution is part of the answer. If things are not being imported, um, then they are produced domestically. And of course, you know, production of armaments um, is another part of the answer. Uh, to Volker's question, uh, let me clarify. I wasn't talking about shortages of critical raw materials. I was talking about the threat of shortages as a result of possible export restrictions. And uh, as you rightly pointed out, you know, the climate does not care who produces solar panels or solar energy, but we do. And think about the discussion we have been having in the EU, the concern about the fact that more than 90% of solar panels are produced in China, about you know, the legislation which um, which expresses the desire to bring back uh, the uh, value chain in solar panels to Europe, right? So the solar panels imported from China are not treated as a subsidized gift from China. They are treated as a threat to jobs. Um, 
Similarly, discussions about tariffs on electric vehicles. So I think uh, very soon we will need to have a discussion in Europe about our hierarchy of objectives. Does climate matter more or does job creation matter more? Yes, uh, on the question uh, from Chris Waller on whether this is a you know, one-off, yes, it's a price level effect. That is a very important caveat, I think, for the policy implications for, for the US. And alongside that, if the you know, path, the counterfactual path or the baseline path for the funds rate over the next couple of years is down, that's important to keep in mind as well. Nevertheless, I think it would have an impact on the discussion whether inflation at the end of 2025 is in the low twos or the low threes, at least as far as the timing of uh, funds rate adjustments is, is concerned. But, uh, but it is a very important caveat to keep in mind. Matthew? Uh, I think I want to return to one of the issues that uh, came up also in the question that uh, Maurice uh, answered to, which is uh, one uh, interest, both, both what I showed and what I, I interpret uh, Morris showed our average effects. And uh, when you look at average effects, uh, you get what you've seen. One uh, interesting result that we found uh, time and again in working on uh, effects of geopolitical risk is the fact that uh, <clears throat> if you do a bit more sophisticated stuff than typical regression analysis, uh, something like uh, quantile regressions, for instance, and look at uh, how typical geopolitical shocks affect the distribution of macroeconomic variables. One robust finding that emerges is the fact that uh, the distribution of macroeconomic outcomes becomes much more uh, widespread in the aftermath of a geopolitical shock. And this is true whether you look at inflation. So you may have, uh, on average, uh, an increase, but you're gonna have uh, a much larger change in the tail of the distribution of inflation that's important. Similarly for GDP, you may have the average effects that actually are masking a lot of heterogeneity with a, a large number, with a small number of countries having huge negative effects and some countries gaining. So when you look at the cross-section, typically one thing that you see is a decrease in the average response of GDP, but a large increase in the dispersion of the effects across countries. You get an increase in inflation and an increase in the dispersion of inflation. So it's an increase in, in uncertainty caused by geopolitical risk that causes itself a change in the conditional distribution of macroeconomic variables. Thank you. So we have already another four speakers. So uh, first, Shetman, please. Thank you, great panel. So geopolitics is, is about production sectors and production sectors are in different countries. We, we heard this from all of you, uh, strongly from Beata, Matteo, uh, uh, Moritz, and Jan also told us that's why trade is an important transmission mechanism. Now, we also heard this is inflationary, and monetary policy still you know, should look at their own country and evaluate every case uh, on its own. But I would like to go back to, I mean, is, is it an enough answer? My, my question is going to be, you know, should monetary policymaker uh, be really thinking in a different way about this, going back to Madame Lagarde's speech last night. I mean, we don't want to throw the old models out, but we want to take this new era and transformation seriously. Let me give you an example. And we went through this example. And what I'm hearing from you is we are going into a world where we are going to have many of these examples. So world demands chips and semiconductors, suddenly a lot, okay? This is what we went through in 2020, 2021 when the supply and production of this thing is constrained. In fact, the 2022 Sintra paper we wrote on inflation drivers exactly calculates inflation based on that. You demand these goods when the supply is constrained. This is asymmetric by sectors, right? A sectoral approach is very important here. What we learned from that work is aggregate demand being high, regardless of you want more iPads or there is stimulative fiscal policy that's going to be much more inflation in a supply-constrained world relative to a world when the world is not supply-constrained. Now, extending our work to 2023 also showed us every country is subject to this uh, global demand-supply imbalance, right? There is a local demand-supply imbalance, but there's also a 
you know, the, the extent countries subject to globally based on its trade and production linkages. So what should central bankers are doing in this environment? This is a very, very difficult environment to do monetary policy because politicians are now in the business of redesigning, changing these trade and production linkages, right, by their own hands, uh, with tra tariffs, with industrial policy. So would you advise to central bankers be on top of this and, you know, change the monetary policy framework or, or no, wait until politicians are done with what they are doing and we are in this world and then rethink. So what are your views on that? Uh, thank you very much. I have to close the list, mm. by the way, because <laughs> we have many speakers. So, Kristen, please. Thank you. Kristen Forbes from MIT. This is a great panel. Uh, is countries around the world are adopting policies around building supply chain resilience, security threats, geopolitical issues. You know, we all have a rough idea of what the direction of the effects, but I don't think we have any good models or frameworks to think about the magnitude of these effects and the trade-offs. And the trade-offs could be very big, and we just need more information like all of you presented, so thank you. Um, with that, I wanted to drill in a little more on some of these magnitudes and these effects. So Moritz, uh, this database on um, history of war is, is fascinating. I was wondering, if, first of all, if you'd broken it down into just conflicts that are not full-fledged wars. One would think that would affect supply chain issues, but maybe not of the same sort of bigger issues. So what are the effects of that? We might live in a world where we see a lot more of that. Um, second, this builds on Ricardo's question, can you look at the effects based on the nature of the country where the war starts? If the war starts in a country that's a major energy exporter and exports raw earth, I would think you'd get very di different effects than if hypothetically you have a war in a major semiconductor uh, exporter. You know, what are the effects of that type of a war in that type of country? You could see production, an immediate supply side effect, but then production could shift more easily than, say, for rare earths. Um, or if you have a war in a country that's a major importer, you know, what are the effects? You might get some very different effects. Um, and then finally, Jan, uh, your, your simulations were very interesting, but it, it looked like you just assume if the U.S. puts on tariffs, there's retaliation in Europe, limited retaliation. What if there's retaliation in China? roughly on par, which would likely occur. What are then the global implications of that for your estimates? So Harald, please. Mm -hmm. yeah, two questions. So Matteo, you showed us the geopolitical uh, risk index, and I was struck that it was very high at the beginning of the Russia-Ukraine war, and then since has declined. And I couldn't quite make uh, sense out of that. It's the sense that, oh, this is now just sort of a stalemate and nothing will happen and the threats by Russia to throw atomic bombs are gone or, you know, how, how do we think about that decline is, is, is a question. Is, is risk really declined in, in that area? The other question is, and, and Beata raised it uh, thankfully, <coughs> and, I, and I wish it had been a more prominent part of the panel, was the risk to the financial system due to the exclusion of the Russian banks from the SWIFT system due to the keeping of the uh, interest rates of, on, on, on Russian frozen funds in the West. You know, it's, it's almost hard to imagine that this doesn't have a huge impact, a huge damage to the financial system in the future, as you mentioned, right? Countries may, that, that are not on exactly friendly terms with the West might not want to, you know, change how they do financial transactions in the future, that maybe the, that China will become a more, play a more dominant role in establishing a global worldwide financial system and currency. And I, I just wonder whether you could comment more on that or whether Jan could comment more on that from the perspective of the private sector. I think that's a really, really important point. Thank you, Harald. Joachim, please. Thank you very much uh, to the panelists and thank you very much for uh, this interesting discussion. But I have also to admit it's a very disturbing discussion and we should forget and we should forget that or, or we, we shouldn't forget at this moment that the let me say the most effective instrument of stopping such a discussion would to stop the war of aggression of Russia against Ukraine and it's important to me that we have to mention this and it brings me also to the point related to the Russian sanctions the sanctions are working, we shouldn't forget that. And we should put more emphasis and more work on how to stop, to circumvent the Russian sanctions. I'm not caring too much if maybe 
uh, these sanctions are triggering a process that maybe the renminbi is becoming more important. It's more important to me to make the sanctions more, more, more effective. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joachim. And final question from Lucrezia. Yes, I mean, this is a, it's a terrible world, and it's a terrible world for central bankers because all of you said that the trade-offs are going to be worse, and so this is going to you know, create some problems for monetary policy. So let me just give you another example, which is more related to, the, to climate, and this is for Beata. So as you said, you know, one way to relax the supply constraint is to do innovation in the green sector. But innovation in the green sector is very sensitive to financial conditions and interest rate because of the nature of innovation in that sector. So, you know, high leverage, uh, uh, you, know, cost, you know, capital upfront and so on. So this may create another trade-offs, which is, uh, you know, that interest rate, uh, high interest rate to face inflation may actually have implications for green innovation. So that would call for maybe other instruments or you know, some coordination with other policies, but you know, it's, it's a very important question, I think, policy wise. So what, what do you think? Thank you. So why don't we start on that side this time? And sure, answer I'll take uh, Kristen's question. To be clear, we do assume retaliation from China. We, we assume retaliation from everybody. What we didn't assume was a special tariff on China over and above the across the board uh, 10%. If that occurred, I would ex again expect retaliation. Of course, the US still runs a trade uh, deficit with, with China, so in that sense it wouldn't, wouldn't be full, but I, I would certainly expect that retaliation. If you did have a large China tariff in addition to what we had here, we'd get substantially larger effects on probably all of the outcome variables that I discussed. Um, so on sanctions, um, sanctions are working, but they are working slowly, right? So uh, some European trade was replaced by exports from Turkey and China, and I'm not talking about intermediated trade, but rather direct production that's being exported. And that trade presumably has a lower technological content than what Europe used to export. So that's going to affect uh, productivity in Russia. Exit of multinational firms from Russia also will limit knowledge flow that were happening uh, thanks to their presence. Um, you also see in the data that trade that's being intermediated via third country um, is more expensive, so Russians are paying more for uh, products that they used to buy directly. Um, so that's also costly. So I think we are going to see slowdown in productivity that is going to affect the Russian economy, but it will take time. It's not something that is happening fast. Uh, on Lucretia's question, I 100% agree with you that higher interest rates uh, will have impact on green uh, innovation, but I think in cases of price spikes, in some critical raw materials, you know, the incentive to innovate is, is quite powerful. So I think uh, that innovation would happen uh, anyway. But of course, you know, th there, is, uh, there is a need to discuss policies to promote green innovation. And that's something one needs to keep in mind. Um, uh, you know, Sebnem raised the issue of local versus uh, global effects. You know, in the best possible world, central banks should have a crystal ball so they understand the mismatches at the local level, at the global level. They can anticipate policy changes. Um, and they can anticipate innovation, right? And I think uh, that's just to, there are too many moving parts to be able to, to make sense of that. So I must say, I don't envy your jobs. <laughs> yeah, uh, very briefly, let me, let me first echo President Nagel's point. I think that's, that's exactly the right conclusion. I think the best supply side policy here is to make that war end and, 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 and get, get uh, a trade and, and uh, reconstruction going. And I think we need to be, we need to learn. I think that also a little bit echoes Shebnam's point. Um, I think European policymakers 
and maybe not so much central bankers, but uh, the others need to learn to navigate this new environment. It's something that Europe has unlearned in very happy circumstances and needs to relearn now. And I think these sort of a more proactive uh, policy framework and thinking differently about managing geopolitical risk is, is a big challenge, maybe less for central bankers than for um, um, uh, economic and, and security policy. Um, Christian, yes, I love that laundry list, and we will look at it. Um, <laughs> we, I'll send you the paper. We do obviously we do go through a lot of things and and and, and do a lot of exclusions and take out the world wars and look at specific countries and um, and play around with the with the what's a large or what's a small war, and we also scale it by trade openness. And the focus so far was really on this the external cost of war, so that we really like wanted to pinpoint that these spillovers. Uh, the external costs that wars impose on the global economy and how that sort of geographically spreads. And uh, I think the numbers actually that we come to, even for the Ukrainian war, are quite significant. I think we're, we're talking about something like 80 billion euros in terms of for the Eurozone and in terms of uh, um, um, output losses. So there's, there's, these are significant numbers. Um, we haven't really drilled that much down into the war side itself. I mean, there's the disaster literature, but I guess you're totally right. We need to go there. Thank you, Moritz. Matteo? So in response to Harald's question, ours is a news-based me measure. And uh, I get what you're getting at is the fact that probably it's capturing the flow of new information about risks. Now, at each point in time, you may wonder, is the level, the overall stock of geopolitical tensions, what the monthly reading is telling you? And probably my, my own suggestion would be, the answer would be probably not, in the sense that when you want to think about the imprint of geopolitical risk on macroeconomic conditions. You want to think about the accumulated uh, flow of uh, shocks that happened in the past. So it's almost like the same uh, way to think about investment and the capital stock. What you see measured is the new information, but at each point in time, what weighs on activity are obviously past shocks too. So the fact that now media attention to the conflict is probably lower than it was two years ago doesn't diminish the importance and the, and the imprint that the conflict is having uh, both on human uh, life and on the economic landscape. So thank you very much. With this, we are coming to the end of this uh, fascinating but a bit somber panel. <laughs> I would like uh, to thank my four panelists who did an excellent job, uh, not only in their presentations, but also in the discussion. Thanks to all of you who uh, actively contributed to the discussion. I very much hope that you gained some insights uh, from our debate. I, I certainly uh, did. And I think now we are up for lunch. <laughs>